All right. Let's, um, today, I am going to part six of the series, The Goodness of God Gives Us Victory at All Times. Part six. The goodness of God gives us victory at all times. Today is part six. All right, I'm going to read a few scriptures. Um, the scripture that Pastor Tony read this morning was not part of my text, but she was in the spirit. So I'm going to also add it to my text. But let's go, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. If you're there, say amen. Holy Spirit, help us this morning understand your word. Somebody say amen. In fact, use your mouth to say it. Holy Spirit, help me understand your word. Speak into my heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, cause there to be a shift in my heart that produces a manifestation in my circumstances. In the name of Jesus, I receive everything that you have for me today. In the name of Jesus, I reject every distraction of the enemy. I reject every interference of the devil to cause the word of God. To not to bear fruit in my life. I declare I benefit maximally by the word of God this morning in Jesus' name. Say a big amen. All right. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis in that verse this morning is through. The victory comes to us through. Meaning, there is a channel through which that victory comes to us. The name of that channel is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So he say. I go to walk through the N1 highway. The N1 is the channel through which you go. He said, they gave me the message through somebody. So that person, the message came through them. So they became the carrier of that message. Jesus is our channel for getting the victory. Hallelujah. So he, he brought the victory to us. What it means is that his victory over sin, his victory over Satan, his victory over death became your victory. Hallelujah. Now that's very important. His victory over sin, his victory over Satan, his victory over death became your victory. So, if he rose from the dead and stamped his feet on the head of Satan, he did it for you. So, where is your feet right now? Come on now. Where is your feet right now? See, you may not feel like it. God is wanting you to start feeling like it. You need to feel the head of Satan under your feet. You need to feel the head of lack under your feet. You need to feel the head of every form of bodily disorder under your feet. This is what Jesus secured for you. You need to feel victory over sin under your feet. So when, when that urge... To do one, two, three, four is rising. You say, no, 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 no. No, back down. I have victory over you. You don't control me. Hallelujah. You tell that urge, you do not control me. Uh -uh, uh -uh. I'm in charge. And I will not allow you to rule me. That's what the Bible means when it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? 
because you have the head of sin under your feet. You can choose to lift your leg, but I refuse to lift my leg. I keep my leg over that nonsense. Why? Because I have a relationship with God. I'm working with the creator of the universe, and he doesn't do sin. And because he doesn't do sin, I cannot do sin. Are you here? So he's giving you authority over sin. He's giving you authority over sickness and disease. I am working with the creator of the universe. If he doesn't get sick, I shouldn't be getting sick. Oh, yeah. So we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I read it again. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me announce to you this morning. You know, one of the things that I want you to do as we are listening to this message, please, I want you to be monitoring your environment. Be looking around. If anybody around you is getting distracted, please, you have my authority to punch them. You have my permission to do what? Punch them. All right. All right. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you another scripture. First John. First John. Chapter 5, verse 4. First John, chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God, are you born of God? Hey, hey, hey. Are you born of God? Somebody say, I'm born of God. He says, whatever. He didn't even say whoever. He said, whatever is born of God does what? Overcomes the world. Hey, hey. Let me, let me, let me unpack this a little bit. If God gives you a vision, that vision is born of God. If God gives you a marriage, that marriage is what? Born of God. If God gives you a child, that child is born of God. If God, listen, if God gives you a job, that job is born of God. If God gives you a business, that business is born of God. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Why? It carries the DNA of God. If my biological son goes to do a DNA test, when they take his blood sample and run the DNA test, it will come out that I am 99 point, I don't know why they say it's 99.9999%. But it will come out that I am 99, he's, he, he is 99.999% my child. Even if you don't see any future, my physical futures on him, just run that DNA test, they will tell you this guy is 99.99% your child. I don't know why it's not 100%. But they say it is so he's, he is made up of things that came from me. The DNA of God is in anything that is born of God. Hallelujah. So if this is why it's important that before you start anything, that you receive it from God. You receive the vision from God. You receive the marriage from God. You receive the the career from God. If it is born of God, it must overcome the world because it carries the DNA of God. God does not fail. Hallelujah. Your, I said, God, your God does not fail. Your God does not, in, he doesn't know defeat. So your, your career is born of God. Hallelujah. Your marriage, if you receive it from God, is born of God. And it overcomes the world. So nothing in this world can quench it. No, no, no. The talent and the ability 
that you have is born of God. And that talent overcomes everything in this world, meaning that it succeeds. Hallelujah. So if you are deploying that talent to any living from it, it overcomes the world. It will succeed. Nothing in this world will be able to hold it back. I don't know if I'm preaching to somebody who came with their faith to the house of God this morning. He said, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. This is the victory that has overcome the world. What? So if you have faith, you already have the victory. Yeah. If there is faith in your heart, you already carry the victory. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So your faith is the victory. Your faith is what? The victory. So the problem that, that you have is to secure your faith. That's the only problem. If you can solve that problem and secure faith, you already have the victory. And what is, what is, what is the faith? Your faith, listen, your faith is activated by God showing you the end. Hallelujah. By God doing what? Showing you, giving you the vision, showing you the end. That's the only work that you have to. So, for us, for me and you, believers, our part is to seek God and hear him give you the vision. Hear him give you the go ahead. Hear him tell you, that's your wife. That's your husband. Hear him tell you, that's the job that I've given to you or that's the business that I want you to get involved. That's all that you need. Once you hear him give it to you, you and you receive it, that's the victory. What, if it is born of God, it must overcome the world. It can't die. Ooh, it cannot die. It cannot, it cannot be buried. Nothing can overcome it. Somebody say, I'm, I am an overcomer. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Let me give you the next one. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It's going to get good this morning. Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Are you there? Romans 8, 37. Can we read together? Put it up on the screen please for me. Romans 8, 37. Yet, in all these things, we are... What are these things? What are these things? It starts in verse 35. What are these things? Look at what the list are. Shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall what? Tribulation. Or distress. What is distress? Let me ask a question. For those of us who are married, if you are having issues with your spouse, is that a form of distress? Yes or no? Yes, it's a form of distress. If you have an issue with your child, is that a form of distress? Severe. <laughs> it's a form of distress. If there's no peace at home, it's a distress. If you're having a challenge at work with colleagues, with your, with your boss, who went to hell to learn tricks from the devil, and then he comes with those tricks to make life miserable for you at work, is that a form of distress or not? It is a distress. It is a distress. If you have a situation at work that is making you not sleep well, it is a distress. He says, shall tribulation. I am thanking God that we don't have tribulation in South Africa against our faith. But that's not the, that's not the case for all Christians everywhere. There are Christians somewhere in the world right now as they gather for church, they are afraid for their lives. Oh, yes. They are very afraid for their lives. But they come anyway. Uh, we hear the stories of the things that are happening in Nigeria, for instance. People gathered in church. And as they are worshiping God, gunmen enter from the back and open fire on everybody. Sometimes five gunmen just enter and start shooting the people in church. 
and people die and gunmen leave and the government says nothing. And yet next Sunday, people will come to church. In that same church, people will gather and come. They will do the burial. They will bury their relatives. They will bury church members. They will bury family members. Next Sunday, they come again. Tribulation. But we thank God that we have peace to serve our God. Amen. He says, tribulation or distress or persecution or famine. What is famine? Hey, what is famine? Huh? A time of lack. Famine is the time when there's no harvest. There's no farm. You put, if you put seed in the ground, the, the, the sun is so hot it doesn't grow. So at the end of three months, there is no harvest. Famine is a, is a time of severe lack. Hallelujah. It's a time of what? But can I show you what God is saying here? Let's, let's continue. He said, all nakedness. Or what? What does that mean? Nakedness is a, is a situation of severe lack, but in addition, you are, there's shame and there's vulnerability. Your dignity is stripped in the lack. That's bad. Hallelujah. That is what? Bad. Very bad. Because the, the least you can bring down any human being is to strip them naked. I remember twice or three times in my life where a thief was caught. I remember when we were in high school, somebody, a thief came to steal laboratory equipment. I went to an all boys school and it was a boarding school. And uh, somebody saw the guy enter the physics lab on a, on a Saturday. And it was, it was just unfortunate for the thief because the person who saw him is a physics student and knows that this is not the physics lab staff, that he was a stranger. So that guy raised an alarm in the hostel that there is somebody in the physics lab. Yo, the whole body house rushed to the physics lab. And I remember hearing that news, I also came. And I know that lab very well. So we went everywhere. We didn't see the guy. But we saw the things he has brought out. So we knew somebody entered here. I know that lab very well. I said, these things were not here when we finished class on Friday. So somebody had brought these things out. He is somewhere in this lab. So when he heard us trying to come in, he actually ran and entered the roof. So I remember as we came there and we started looking, I noticed a manhole in the roof. I said, this manhole is usually closed. I know this lab. This manhole is usually closed. So the fact that it's open, he's in the roof. Boys entered the roof and we found him there. We dragged him from the roof and brought him down. Yo, they beat him. All manner of weapons in the lab was used on him. And then we stripped him naked. Tore his clothes. Imagine maybe, you know, 100 boys beating one person. People were taking turns to, you know, demonstrate their karate skills. And they beat him and stripped him naked. Everything, to the, to everything, bare naked. And we paraded him the whole school camp. We wanted to kill him, but teachers intervened and said, no, we shouldn't kill him. Because boys, people went and brought petrol. We were born him today. He wants us to fail, idiot. And they stripped him. And I remember where the time we tore his clothes, even me, I felt sorry for him. He was trying to cover his nakedness and they were beating him. So he didn't know whether to dodge the punches or to cover his nakedness. And it was really bad. So I understand this scripture. When the Bible says nakedness is a state of helplessness. Hallelujah. Is a state of what? Helplessness. When you're just helpless, you can't help yourself. No, there's nobody to help you. There's nobody to run to you. Look at, um, uh, look at the next one. He said, or peril, or sword. When this was written, guns had not been manufactured. So
So, so when they say peri, peri means danger. Or sword. Sword means imminent death. You know, in those days, swords were so strong and so heavy and sharp that somebody can wield sword and decapitate you with one swipe of the sword and cut off your neck. Bam! Your neck falls on the ground like that. And that's how people were killed. You know, a strong man just takes the sword, whoop, and your head falls off in one blow. Pew, your head falls off like the head of a chicken. Now, God says, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, whether it is nakedness, whether it is famine, whether it is peril, whether it is sword, in, whether it's distress, in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors. So, listen. You are not a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. Let me explain the difference. You are not a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. A conqueror is somebody who fought and they won. It's somebody who did what? Fought and they won. And usually, when you watch any of these combat sports, like MMA, like, you know, bare, bare knuckle boxing, like even normal boxing, or judo, or any of those combat sports, after round 15, or round five, or whatever, wherever the thing ends. Both fighters are bruised. They're injured. Some of the times, the guy is declared a winner, but he's bleeding. His face is swollen. You know, sometimes when I watch those fights, I say, thank God for the line of work that God has called me, that I don't have to fight to any living. What a terrible way to any a living. What a terrible way to any a living. They beat you up, bruises everywhere. I saw a recent boxing fight. The champion, after they declared him, he had cuts on his lips, on his eyes, everywhere. He has bruises. But he won. But he has bruises. But the modern conqueror, he does, has no bruises. Hallelujah. He has no bruises. He, has, he didn't fight in the game. He didn't. They just handed the victory to him. Somebody explain. The boxer fights and is the conqueror. The boxer's wife is the modern conqueror. Because she's, she gets the 10 million, 10 million prize, prize money for winning. She gets the belt and she leaves the belt. Nobody beat her. Nobody punched her. The only thing she, she has is that she, is, she has a marriage certificate. That's what makes her more. So she gets the blessings of winning without any of the challenges. So when you are a modern conqueror in a famine, you didn't experience it. Oh. So if the famine came, you didn't know. That is a mindset. Hallelujah. That is what? It's a way of thinking. You will understand it as I go on this morning. It's a way of thinking that even whatever it is you are going through, tell yourself, I am more than a conqueror. I am not just a conqueror. I am what? More than a Meaning that whatever the fight has as a negative does not remain on your body. Whatever the fight has as consequences of being in this fight, you are exonerated from it. So you can go through the fire, but it won't burn you. You can go through the flood, but it won't drown you. That's what makes you more than a conqueror. A conqueror goes through the fire and he has some, some scotches on his body, but he's winner. A modern conqueror goes through the fire, but he's not burnt. No, the Bible says when, when, when Shadrach, Bishan, and Abednego came out from the fire, they couldn't even smell fire on their bodies. That's more than a conqueror. In fact, they came out of the fire better than when they came in. Because when they threw them in the fire, they were, they were tied. They were tied. 
They were in bondage and they threw them in the fire. The fire burnt the things that tied them. So when they come out of the fire, they came out with no bondages and no smell of fire. That is what modern conqueror is. And you know why? Because when they threw them in the fire, Jesus showed up in the fire for them. When Jesus showed up in the fire, he neutralized every effect of the fire. So they came out with no scratches. That's what it means. Somebody said more than a conqueror. So there is a mindset you take that even when they throw you into the fire, you're not afraid. Do you know that Daniel went into the lion's den and came out no scratches? Not one scratch. When they saw him in the morning, he slept well. The king says, are you still there? He said, what do you expect? I'm here. So that's what it means to be more than a conqueror. You don't have the negative consequences of what you got, went through. You can go through the fire, but it will not burn you. Come on, somebody say amen. This is what it means. So because of the more than conqueror, we are not afraid to go through the fire. We are not afraid to go through the flood. We are not scared. Because you know that it will not leave a negative mark on you. I'm saying something to somebody this morning. It doesn't matter what the challenges are. God says there's a guarantee in his word. It will not leave a negative mark on you. It will not leave a negative. In fact, you will come out better. Look at all the examples I've given. Every one of them that went through those situations, they came out better. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out better. Daniel came out better. Hallelujah. So, that's what it means to be more than a conqueror. A more than a conqueror does not have the negative effects of the fight on their body. But the benefits, the, the, the blessings, and the reward of the fight, he gets it with no negative effect. So, the reward of the fight is in your hands. Oh, yeah. Uh, I said the reward, the, the, the prize money for the fight is in your hands with no bruises with no scars, with no injuries, in the mighty name of Jesus. That's what it means to be a more than a conqueror. And he says, yet in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him. Do you see that word through again? Through him who loved us. Through him who loved us. So, he went for the fight for you. Jesus went in for the fight for you. And then he beat the enemy. He took the punishment of sin. He took all that beating and then reversed it and came out victorious. And when he came out victorious, he handed you the victory. Hallelujah. Somebody said, Jesus has handed me the victory. I have the prize money. This is our position in Christ. I have the victory through him who loved us. So I am, so verse 38 goes on to say, I am persuaded. I am what? Do you know what it means to be persuaded? To be what? Fully convinced. I am persuaded. I need you to mark that word persuade. Are you with me? Are you to, I need you to what? Underline the word Persuaded. We're coming to it. I am persuaded that neither death nor life death is the last enemy. Death is the biggest enemy of the natural man. Are you, are you here with me? Death is what? The biggest enemy of the natural man. Whether it's spiritual death or emotional death or physical death is the biggest enemy of the natural man. But thank God you are not a natural man. I say you are not a natural man. He says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present. Are you dealing with things present? Yes, present things. The state of your bank account is present. The state of the debts you owe is present. Is the, the state of, of things with your finances is present. The state of things in your marriage that is making you happy. There are things present. Hallelujah. There are what? Things present. 
I was teaching on Friday, I thank God it's Friday. When things present are put under the carpet in your relationship and they are not resolved, there are things present. They are just under the carpet, but they are there. It doesn't matter where you go. If you leave your house, go away for one week. If you come back, what is under the carpet is still there. It is still there. It doesn't hide. It doesn't go away because you traveled. You might go away and have a good time. If you don't deal with what is under the carpet, it's still there. All right. So things present. No things to come. No things to come. No height. No depth. No any other created thing. So whether they are demons, whether they are powers, it doesn't matter. Nothing created shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is too much. This is too much. Meaning that if I get a revelation of the love of God for me, it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to use to threaten me. It just does not work. It, does, it just does not work. When you understand the extent of the love of God for you. So, the lack does not work. The pain does not work. Even death itself does not work. Hallelujah. Principalities, powers, it doesn't matter who they are, what they are. Nothing can disconnect you from the flow of the love of God. And let me tell you something about the love of God. The love of God is not just an emotional feeling. Please understand this. The love of God is not just what? An emotional feel. It's not a feeling. The love of God is the flow of the power and the resources and everything that God is in your direction. That's what it means. So, so when God loves you, it's not, it's not like me telling you I love you, but I can't help you. Uh-uh. When, when the love of God is flowing through you, his help and his power is in that flow. Everything God is. That's why when, when the Bible says that he who gave his son, will he not with him, somebody say with him, with him freely give you all things. Because when God gives you his love, everything that God is comes behind it. His power comes behind. His, his, his wisdom comes behind. In other words, when the love of God is flowing in your direction, nothing Nothing can challenge you. Nothing can withstand you. It's like, I, I, another way to help your mind capture, it's like a huge tsunami. I don't know, if you, if you go home, go on YouTube and just type, you know, videos of tsunami. And see how this floods. Nothing is spared. They carry bridges. They carry buildings. They, nothing. Nothing stands. You see big buildings like this just give way. To the floor. The floor just carries it as if it's carrying, it's carrying toys. Bridges fall apart. I've, I've watched a number of those videos. Bridges fall apart. Buildings, cars, whatever it is. Nothing stops it. It just carries it. This is how the tsunami of God's love. It bulldozes everything that stands in the way. So when he says, I am fully persuaded. That this is the persuasion that everybody needs to come through. Amen. This is what the conviction that you need to come through. That nothing can separate you from the resources of God. Nothing can separate you from provision. Nothing can separate you from healing. Nothing can separate you from, from victory because of the love of God. Hallelujah. All right. Let me read uh, another one. This one is the one that Pastor Tony read. And I want to read it in the TPT, the Passion Translation. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. Please, pay attention. Somebody said, Pastor, I'm listening. Say it again. Oh yeah, let's go. He says, I know what it means to lack. And I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I am trained. Somebody said trained. I am trained. 
Do you know what it means to be trained in something? When we're university students, I was trained to be an engineer. And I remember many, many times, especially from year three, year three, year four, year five, everybody who taught us, everybody who taught me from year three, year four, year five was an engineer. So from year three, nobody else taught us except engineers. And all our lecturers who were engineers, they used to say this to us. There is a discipline of being an engineer. And they tried to inculcate it. They say you can't go through the faculty without the faculty going through you. So you, you are expected to do things according to certain codes and certain standards. And they will not spare you. I remember one lecturer who used to be so strict. You say you can't, you, you can't. He said the error, the margin of error is 0 0.001. You can't pass that margin of error. Because if you do, you are in jeopardizing people's lives. You will make designs that will explode. Things will happen. People will die. Money will be lost. Billions can be lost. So you're not allowed. In fact, I remember there are certain designs. The error, the, the error, margin of error is 13 digits. 13, 13. 1.3, 13 digits. You can't miss it. If you miss it, you fail. You have to be precise. Hallelujah. Hey. Remember one of those exams. My God. I'm writing an exam and my, my figures are diverging. I started crying in the exam hall. Because, because I knew I failed it. Because you see, I saw my figures. Instead of the decimal places reducing, as you are making the calculation, it's increasing. You know you failed it. You can mark yourself right there. What is going on? What am I missing? Because you are taught to be precise. Hallelujah. Engineering is about what? Precision. So they won't allow you. You are taught to be precise. Because if you make mistakes, your design will collapse. The building, things will happen to people. And they tell us the reason why we are being strict is so that you are well cooked and well baked. Hallelujah. So, when you say train, God is interested in your becoming something. He says, for I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Whoa. There is a secret to overcoming all things. Are you hearing me this morning? There is what? A secret to overcoming how many things? I want to ask you a question. Do you know the secret? Are you willing for the Holy Spirit to teach you the secret of overcoming all things? There's a secret. Many believers don't know that secret. People are coming to church. They don't know the secret of overcoming all all things. God wants to hand you that secret. Hallelujah. And do you know something about this secret? You know, we all can be in church like this. And the Holy Spirit is going around, opening people's eyes to the secret. The secret must be given to you, you and God. You and you must get it from him directly. We may be in a group now but the secret is handed to you personally. So, this is why this work is an individual work. You must get your own access to the secret. So, there is a secret of overcoming all things. This is what we are trying to learn in this series. The secret of overcoming all things. Listen, he says, whether in fullness or in hunger... I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. So what he's saying here is that when you have the secret of overcoming all things, every difficulty you conquer. Every difficulty you what? So when you know that you have the secret of overcoming all things, you know that difficulties don't scare you anymore. Hallelujah. You know, 
in Nigeria, we used to drive cars that we bought secondhand. And these cars are very old. So sometimes you are traveling long distance. And to have peace of mind, sometimes you hire a mechanic to travel with you. Yes, you pay the mechanic to go with you on the journey. And the mechanic in the car gives you confidence that whatever it is, whenever the car starts coughing, <laughs> that the mechanic will sort whatever is out. So having the mechanic with you gives you what? Confidence. So, so you, you go with him knowing that whatever happens in the course of this five-hour journey, I am covered because I've got a mechanic here. So sometimes you travel with the mechanic so that he can attend to whatever whenever it happens. Now, I want you to understand this. When you learn the secret of overcoming all things, you're not scared of the journey. You're not scared of what? God wants you to come to a place where you are not scared of nothing. Are you here with me this morning? Where you're not scared of anything. That you, are, you have the secret of overcoming all things. I want to show you what the secret is. Are you ready? Somebody say, Lord, open my eyes. Right. I taught us last week that there are five levels of victory consciousness. How many of us remember? There are what? Five levels. The first level of victory consciousness is where we have victory as a thought. Please put it up for me on the screen. Victory as what? Just a thought. It's a mental accent. That's the first level. Believers come into that first level as as you come into Christ in your experience. So some of us are still at that first level. Victory as a thought. Okay, now you have seen me show you in scriptures that you have the victory. You saw it. Didn't you see it in the scriptures we read this morning? We have the victory. It's a thought. So you know that thought in your head. That's your first level. That thought. Now that thought can help you in certain situations, you can, you know, assert the thought, I have the victory. And Satan can run away. Because, you know, you have the mental accent. However, sometimes Satan drinks alcohol. Demons drink steroids. And they are not scared of you. <laughs> have you ever dealt with a devil that drank something. Like Pharaoh. Chasing the people of God. After he lost his son. His son. Was, was killed the night before. And not only his son. The Bible said that Pharaoh came with 600 soldiers. All those 600 soldiers. That Pharaoh came with. They all experienced losses the day before. The firstborn child in every Egyptian home including animals, were killed by the, by the death angel. The only people who did not have casualty were the people of God. After Pharaoh suffered that kind of casualty, Pharaoh buried his son and then drank alcohol and said, ha, how can these people go? They cannot go. They cannot. This was the same Pharaoh who was begging Moses the night before. Moses, come and go. I, in fact, Moses pray for me. The, the grief was so much. Pharaoh was subdued that night. When he woke up in the morning and his son was dead, he asked himself, what kind of thing is this? What am I doing? Why am I holding these people back? I've lost everything. Our economy is in shreds. Everything has gone. And now my son is dead. Please, please let them go. Because the next thing is that me, I'm going to die. That was why Pharaoh eventually said to the people, Moses, he begged Moses, come and take your people and go. Because he had had it. Because he started questioning to himself, why am I keeping these people? I am losing everything. And I'm being stubborn. Why? 
And then immediately the people left. His demons came back. He suddenly realized, ah, why did I let them go? Ah, 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 ah. No, they can't go. Ah, they can't go. Then he called his, he, the heads of his army. Hey, assemble the best soldiers. We can't let those people go. The, the, boy, the boy said, what? Sir, <laughs> I haven't buried my son. He said, what kind of son are you talking about? I need you. We are going after those people. We can't let them go. Gather everybody, idiot. Which kind of son? Didn't I lose my son too? All of us lost sons. Gather everybody. They gathered themselves, mounted their, so, their, their horses, and began to chase after the people of God. These were people who have suffered tremendous losses. And yet, they are coming after the people of God with vengeance. When the people of God saw them, the Bible said, when they looked back and they saw Pharaoh coming, yo, the Bible says their hearts melted with fear. But these were people who the night before, they were bold. The Bible said they left Egypt with boldness. First level of victory. They were happy when they saw uh, 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 the, the, the Egyptian neighbors crying. And then their own children were spared. Remember, the instruction was put the blood on the doorpost of your house. For when I see the blood, I will what? Pass over. So they did it. And that night, the, the, the whole children of Israel were spared of, of the disaster. In the morning, everybody else were crying. They were rejoicing. And now, they were rejoicing. They were happy. Suddenly, all that rejoicing evaporated. That's the problem with level one. Level one is unstable under pressure. Level one is what? Unstable under pressure. Under pressure, people who are in level one start panicking. I want to ask you a question. Where are you? Where are you? People in level one start panicking. They start worrying. They start fretting. They start running helter-skelter. Some of them start grumbling. Some of them start what? And complaining. And start saying God is not good. They start doubting the deliverance of the Lord. That is the problem with level one people. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you a level one victor? You need to upgrade. Help me tell your neighbor, upgrade. How you know where you are. When pressure, when Pharaoh comes marching at you. When you hear the galloping of horses of Pharaoh coming. What happens in your heart? You know, if you have the secret of overcoming all things, the galloping of Pharaoh does not scare you. Are you here? When you have the secret of overcoming all things, the, the warming of the furnace and heating of the furnace seven times does not scare you. Somebody say, Lord, give me the secret of overcoming all things. Right, level number two. So the people of God, as they left Egypt, were level one people. They started grumbling. What did they do? Ah, Moses! Ah, we told you, leave us there. Is it not better that we died in Egypt than to come and die here? Look at Pharaoh behind us. Moses, we told you. Bible said they gathered together and started shouting at Moses. That's the problem. People get angry at me. Tell, I'm telling you now, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a while. People get angry at me. When the devil put pressure on them, they blame the pastor. Yeah, I know. They get angry. Pastor, it's you. How is it me? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with my own pharaohs. <laughs> Number two level. When you graduate from mental accent of victory. And how do you graduate? To the mental act from level one to level number two, you come into a persuasion. It is what? A persuasion, conviction. Level number two is what I call victory as a mindset. It had conviction. You are persuaded that nothing can separate you from the love of God. You are persuaded that the power of God will come through even in this situation. Pharaoh, we are not scared of you. You can be coming. Because I know 
the God that I believe in, that he will make a way where there seems to be no way. So you, even though you don't know where the way is going to come from, but you're not panicking. Hallelujah. There's a level. Somebody say, Lord, give me the secret of overcoming all things. So, so somebody at level two is coming into an understanding of that secret. That is what brings them to a hard conviction. They are persuaded. They are persuaded that neither death nor life. So, so their heart is not shaking. They know God is going to come through. They know that God is what? So they don't panic. They know. I don't know if it's a miracle I need. A miracle will manifest. Oh, yes. And they see miracles. Hallelujah. How many of us believe that we still serve a God of? If you haven't seen miracles, me, I've seen them. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I have seen them time and time and time and time and time again. And me, I'm a living, walking miracle. Then we go to level number three. Level number three is victory as a lifestyle. Victory as what? So you have won several challenges before. What brings you to level number three is that you have been winning, winning, winning. You, initially you panicked. Then you saw God come through. Then you noted it. Then at the next one, you held on, held on, held on, held on. Then you panic small. Then you saw God come through. Then you noted it. You are growing. Hallelujah. Before you panicked at the first second. Now you can hold your peace for a few more days with no panic. You are growing. Then, see, this growing is training you. That's what that scripture says. I know. It says, for I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Make that your confession. Make that your confession. I am trained. Somebody say trained. Copy that scripture. Write it down on your, on your fridge. I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Wake up in the morning every day. Declare to yourself, I am well trained in the secret of overcoming all things. You know one of the things that doctors they are well trained to handle emergency. Pilots are well trained to handle emergency. It's amazing the, the kind of composure pilots have when things are going wrong. They don't panic. Their training has brought them to a place they don't panic. They know this plane is going down, but they don't panic. In fact, they are not even allowed to communicate the amount of problems they are having in the, pop, uh, in the cockpit to the passengers. They are calm. They make the announcement of imminent danger with calmness. They are trained. And many times, the very well-experienced pilots have diverted danger because they are trained to handle emergency. They are not panicking. They are just they are doing the best they can. Even when the plane is, is about to crash, they say brace for a, a crash. They know it's crashing, but they are not panicking. Hallelujah. This is what training does to you. Training brings you to a place where this thing doesn't, they, don't pan, they don't panic you. Somebody say, I have been trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Right. So, you go to level number three. Where that training is now manifesting. Let me tell you a little bit about this level number three. It's where I call habitual victory. In this level, you just win. You just what? A man of God said something. I love that man of God. I like to listen to him. He said, if trouble came, I didn't see it. If trouble came, I didn't what? Why? It's not that trouble didn't come. It came, but he didn't see it. Why? Because his consciousness has been trained for victory. He doesn't see trouble. He said once his driver came back and announced that the car got burnt and burnt to ashes and the driver was crying. He said, is that why you're crying? A car got burnt. You're here. Why are you crying? 
for him. A car got burnt and that's it. It's like paper got burnt. This, that's the reason for you to be crying. The God we serve is able to give us a thousand times more. So why are you crying? The person is crying because they don't know. When you know that there is restoration for more, do you cry? You don't cry. Hallelujah. You don't cry. Some friends of mine were telling me last week how their car was stolen. They were not saying it with a sense of loss. You know why? They have insurance. Insurance is already processed. In fact, insurance gave them a courtesy car. While the insurance is processing a payout for them to buy another one. They're not, they're not crying. Because they know they have insurance. Insurance is going to pay out. So why are they crying? And there's no inconvenience. They have a courtesy car they're using. God wants you to come to a place. You know that you know that you know that you are trained in the secret of overcoming all things. So you don't panic. You don't stress. Hallelujah. This is the church that God wants to raise. A people who know their God and they don't panic at anything. Somebody say amen. As you grow in the lifestyle of victory, let me tell you something about that, that level. You see, when you are at that level number three, you even begin to make choices without, without thinking about it. You make choices that lead you to victory. Now, now I, I saw as I was meditating on this, these levels that I'm sharing with you, I got it by revelation. As I meditated on this, I realized that this thing is the same, level, is the same thing with the levels of making money. It's the, level, it's the same thing with the levels of what? Wealth creation. If you, if you go home, look at it very well. There's a first level with a thought of, of wealth creation. It's a thought. Mm, it's a thought. It's not, you're not well grounded in it. Then you go to the next level where it is a persuasion. You know what you know. <laughs> that whatever it is, I'll make money. I, I, I remember when we were much younger. A very wealthy man in America came out of a lawsuit and he lost everything. When he came out from the court and stepped on the steps of the court, he, they, he lost everything. Everything were taken from him. And the journalist came to him and said, you lost the case and everything. He said, he looked at them. He said, give me 12 months. I'll be back. Just, he, said, he said to them, I remember, I remember that, that footage on CNN where he announced it. He said, give me 12 months, I'll be back. Why would he make that kind of announcement when everything was stripped from him? Because he had some things he knew. Hallelujah. He knew the secret of making money. He just said, give me 12 months, I will be back. You know, it's like when, when, when Tiger Woods was going through his issues, how many of us remember? Tiger Woods was going through his issues and he left golf. And I remember they, they interviewed him. He just said to the journalist, I'll be back. With a calmness about it, I will be back. Because what brought him to the top? He knew it. Golf, I can play with my eyes closed. So I'll be back. He made that announcement. Guess what? He was back. Was he back? He was back. Why? He was well trained in his craft. May God give you well serious training in victory. That it doesn't matter what it is. You know I have the secret of overcoming all things. Hallelujah. Number four is the level of victory that I call victory as a culture. So not now, it's not just that you are winning. You are now influencing the people around you to win. You are building a culture of winning. Your children know how to win. Your spouse, know, your parents, everybody around you know how to win. Can I tell you something? One of the best things to teach your children is how to win. Hallelujah. You must teach them how to win. So when they go through challenges, even when you are going through challenges, don't shield them from it. Because you need to show them, we're going through this, but we're coming out. Because they also need to learn it. Hallelujah. I wish I learned 
some of these things from my parents. I learned them in church. I learned them from God. But I wish I was trained from infancy not to fear opposition. Not to fear battles. I read a story of uh, the virgin man. What's his name? Richard Branson. They were going on a family holiday. True story. And two, two, two cousins in the car were making an argument about swimming. And his son was part of the argument. And he knows the boy cannot swim. So, as they were driving, they came to a bridge. He stopped the car. And said, this argument, we will settle it now. To the water. He knew, clearly, his son cannot swim. And they are arguing. He stopped the car, matched the two boys into the water. Jump in. Where the argument ends here. Jump in. Let us settle the argument. And I'm thinking, what kind of father is that? You knew that boy cannot swim. And you're asking him to jump into the water. Can you imagine the mind? So, when they got to the water, he, this one who cannot swim became fearful. He said, no, no, it's not allowed. You must jump in. And he made them jump in. Even the one that cannot swim jumped in. And when he was drowning, he jumped in and saved the boy. But he made him jump in. In his mind, this is how people learn. Not all this talk is nonsense talk. Jump in. And when the joy jumped in and said drown, he jumped in and saved the boy. But the argument ended that day. And I thought, what a way to parent. What a way to parent. We shield our children from these things. He said, the boy said, this was how he learned. Not to make unnecessary bragging. They didn't need to, this was one lesson. To make unnecessary bragging. So, the point is, a winner thinks in a different way. I teach it when I teach parenting. It takes a champion to raise a champion. It takes what? A champion to raise a champion. If you're not a champion, you can't raise a champion. If you have not learned how to win, you can't teach your children how to win. This is why you need to learn how to win. Amen. So, so that you are not afraid to expose them to danger. Because they need it. Hallelujah. Are they going to be tied to your apron spring for the rest of their lives? They need to learn how to survive. They need to learn how to stand bullies. They need to learn how to stand the devil. Look him eyeball to eyeball and say, my father raised me well, idiot. Back off in the name of Jesus. Amen. You need to raise children that can look the devil eyeball to eye and tell him, back off, idiot. My father raised me well. You are a victor. Let me round this up. Victory, the next level is victory as a civilization. This is the highest level. Now, now let, me, let me drop this as I round this message up. Listen to this. When Jesus came out from the grave on resurrection morning, he brought every believer into level five. Amen? He brought you into what? Now let me explain something. There are two dimensions of truth that you need to understand. The first is positional truth. Somebody say positional truth. Positional truth means this is where you were brought in by who you are in your position in Christ. Is a positional truth. Now, you need to know the positional truth and then make that truth your objective. Make that truth yours. And then there is experiential truth. So there is what? Positional truth and there is what? Come on. There is positional truth and there is what? Now, Jesus 
Jesus, as he was born in the manger, and he started growing, he had a knowledge of his position with the Father. He knew that he was one with the Father. The Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, he said he did not consider equality with God an act of robbery. In other words, it was not illegal to see himself as one with God. So he knew his position. Me and my father are one. That was the positional truth. He knew it as a human being growing up in his parents' house. He held on to that position. Then lived his life manifesting these levels that I'm teaching you now. Jesus went through all of them. Are you here? Jesus went through all of them to the point where it became his experience at the highest level. So when he started his ministry, where do you think he was in this grading that I showed you? Where was Jesus when he started his ministry? Level, level what? Level three going on four. Because it's at level four that you build a community. Remember that when he started his ministry, what did he start doing? He built a community. He built disciples. He started teaching them to win. He started teaching them to win. Is that not what he was doing? He even sent them two by two to go and heal the sick. To go and chase devils out. When the boys came back, they came back with rejoicing. They said, we saw devils obey us. We saw sicknesses healed. Jesus said, you're getting the training. He trained them to win. So he, had, he, he started his ministry as he exited level three, going on level four. And, and level four, he began to grow a community, build a culture of victory, train people how to win. And then for three and a half years, he moved from four and then eventually gave his life. Now remember that before he died, he told his disciples, I will lay down my life and I will come back. Did he say it or not? He said it. So when he was saying it, had he died? No. When he was saying it, had he conquered death? No. But did he know he was going to conquer death? Yes. Because he has a position he had taken in the spirit. So he was declaring his position. So when he was telling them, I am going to die three days, I will come back. He was declaring a position. He hadn't proven it. But he knew he was going to prove it. Did he prove it? Did he prove it? He did. He died and came back. The morning that he came back, the Bible says the angels rolled the stone away from the mouth of the tomb. And then he came back. Came back to life. Got up. Removed the grave clothes. Wrapped them up. Put them in a neat pile in the, in the tomb. And then came out. And when he came out, people had come to the, to the graveside to look for him. And there was a woman there who saw him and didn't know he was the master. And the Bible said the woman thought he was a gardener. And he said, did you see? Did you see the master? I looked in the grave. He is not there. They have come to steal his body. Did you see him? And she was crying. And the, the so-called gardener, he saw there. He didn't know he was the master. The master said, it's I. And the woman was shocked when he heard the voice of the master. And recognized him that he's the master. The master says, I am not a gardener, it's me. And he, she came to hug him. The master said, don't touch me. I'm yet to ascend to the father. Don't, don't touch me. Let me go. I will, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to meet you there. Hallelujah. The woman was the first person to see the risen Lord. Hallelujah. As he came out from the grave, he manifested experientially what he knew positionally. By the same process, you also, you also, you need to accept your position. What is your position? I have been raised with Christ from the dead. I have the victory over everything, including death. Somebody declared, I have victory over death, over sin. Over Satan, over sickness, over famine, over lack. This is your position. So by position, you're already raised to level five. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? So this position, listen to me, this position at that highest level must become your reality in your consciousness. You have to see this position. You have to visualize it. You have to mem uh, uh, meditate on the word of God until this position is clear. This is who I am. That is the secret of overcoming all things. Oh. That is what? The secret of overcoming. To see yourself in the risen Christ. This is who I am. So when the Bible talks about, I have been trained in the secret of, of overcoming all things. This is it. To see yourself as the risen Christ. That's the secret of overcoming all things. Because when you're standing with Jesus at the mouth of the grave, you know I have authority over things. I have authority over Satan. I have authority over death. I have authority over any situation or circumstance that can face me. And then, as you lock in on that position, life's circumstances and situations begin to throw themselves at you. How do you overcome them? By asserting your position. How did Jesus overcome death? By what? Asserting his position. He prophesied his resurrection before he died. That's faith. That's what? Faith speaks. Faith sees. Faith speaks. You got to see it and speak it. So he saw his resurrection and declared it with his mouth. This is the secret of overcoming all things. You need to see your position in the risen Christ. You need to see yourself, I am a level 5 operator. Hallelujah. And then, create, listen, create a mental image of yourself as the risen Christ. This is the training so, all the things, listen, all the challenges you are facing right now, they are nothing but opportunities for you, for you to progress in the levels. You got to understand it. So, when you understand it, challenges are no longer scaring you. Let me tell you something. How do you get promoted without going through tests? When we were in school, the reason why we write exams is so that we what? We can be promoted to the next class. To show that you have mastered this level and the test now, you know, proves it and then you go to the next class. So exams can be scary, but the truth is I need to pass it to go to the next level. So my father taught us when we were in school, you don't pass an exam in the exam hall. You don't fail an exam in the exam hall. You fail the exam in your study, on the table where you study. You pass the exam in the study where you study. That's where you pass the exam. So, if you prepare well, you will not be scared of the exam. When you have prepared properly, you are not scared of the exam. In fact, you are walking into an exam with confidence to show what you know. Preparation in the in your study, gives you confidence to march into the exam. I learned that thing from my father. So when we were writing our final exams in secondary school, I was so excited to go to the exam hall. You know why? Because I had prepared so well. For the last 10 years before I wrote that exam, I have solved every problem in every exam, past exam questions. And I have passed them. So I knew how to solve the problems. So when I walked into the exam, I, I was walking there with confidence. In fact, I remember once, my mother called me and said, your confidence is too much. He said, calm down. My mother said, calm down. Your confidence is too much. Calm down. Because I knew that I prepared well. Because I took what my parents said, you don't pass the exam in the hall. You pass the exam in, in your study. And for the last several months, I've been studying and I've been solving all the problems and I've been getting them. So I knew that I'm going into this exam, I'm coming out with an A. And do you know that's exactly what happened? Straight A's, eight, eight subjects, all of them A's. That's what I came out with. Because I prepared. You don't pass an exam at the exam hall. You pass it in the place where you study. So if you didn't study, 
you'll be panicking. If you study it, you're walking with confidence. I am saying to you, the things you are going through right now is training. So stop being scared of your training. It's for your necessary elevation in the steps to the highest level. So what do you do? God wants you to learn your position. Hallelujah. This position, you must be clear on it. You must what? You have to have a mental image of your position in Christ. I have been raised from the dead with Christ. That's the first level. You must so accept it that you have been raised with Christ from the dead. Somebody de declare with your mouth. With Christ from the dead. Nothing, including death itself, scares you because you've overcome it. Then number two, I'm, I want to show you now quickly as I round up how to build victory consciousness and grow in the levels. Number two, visualize victory. Visualize what? Whatever it is you are dealing with, visualize victory. See yourself because God's word says you have already overcome. Accept it. I've overcome in this situation. What are you facing? Financial situation. What are you facing? Marriage challenges. What are you facing? Challenges at work. What are you facing? I don't care. See yourself in this situation. I have won. I have what? I have won. See, vis visualize victory. Number three, confess the word of God. Confess the promises of God. Hallelujah. This is where many of us are not doing the work we ought to do. The word of God has not taken root. This is why you're panicking. You're panicking because the promise that God will provide for you hasn't taken root in your consciousness. Because when it takes root in your consciousness, when you want to panic, that word stands up and says, why are you panicking? God will provide. When, when you want to panic, hey, how are we going to pay the bill? The word stands up inside of your heart and says, God has made a way. And you know, that, that word inside of you is actually what makes a way. Suddenly, money you are not expecting from anywhere just opens up. I am telling you what I live. Suddenly, somebody that has not spoken to you in the last 10 years or 11 years remembers you and sends you the money you need. Suddenly, an opportunity opens up and work comes in. Something you didn't apply for starts looking for you. Why? A job position you never knew existed. They, they come calling you. This is what happens. God makes a way where there seems to be no way because you have confidence. Somebody say, I win. So you start speaking the word of God. Start confessing it until that word goes deep inside of your heart to challenge whatever the devil is trying to put across. Satan is trying to tell you there's a symptom in your body. The word, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed, is stronger than the symptom. So every time the symptom kicks, that word kicks it. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And before you know it, the word inside of you triumphs over that symptom and conquers it and brings it down. And suddenly you don't feel the symptom anymore. I am telling you what I know. That's how it works. Number four. Focus on growth. Focus on growth. How are you interpreting what you are facing? I'm teaching you how to grow in the levels. How are you interpreting the challenges in your life right now? How are you interpreting it? You need to understand that your current challenges are nothing but opportunities for growth in victory consciousness rather than obstacles to victory and success. You see, you can look at the situation and cry that this situation is so hard. The situation is so difficult. Or you can look at the situation and say, Father, thank you that your power is showing up to subdue this nonsense. It's how you are seeing it. This thing is supposed to make you better, not bitter. 
I said the challenges you are facing right now is supposed to make you what? Better, not bitter. So you need to see it. From, that is what I call the victory consciousness. Because you look at your situation from a victory mentality. Do you know that Joseph, Joseph faced all manner of difficulties and challenges. But he never became bitter. His brothers wanted to kill him. In fact, they wanted to murder him. They, they betrayed him and sold him into slavery. In fact, the person who suggested that they sell him, his name is Judah. Judah says, what's, what's the point killing this idiot? There's no benefit. There's no benefit. We kill him, we lose, we lose everything. There's no benefit. Let's sell him and make money. And he'll be gone forever. We will go home and tell our father he's been killed. We will take this coat of many colors he's wearing that he's been using to rub in our face. We kill one of these sheep. Take the blood. Stain on this cloth. Tell, take it to our father. Tell him that a wild animal ate his son. Tear it in pieces. And that's exactly what they did. They took his clothes home and told their father, do you recognize this cloth? We saw this cloth in the bush. Ah, his father said, what? He said, bring it, bring it. He examined, this is the, this is the cloth I made for my son. Ah, I said, we don't know. This is what we saw in the bush. And we saw blood. A wild animal must have eaten him. A lion ate him or a bear ate him, something. A jaguar came out from nowhere, tore him in pieces, ate up his meat. We didn't see any meat. All we saw is the clothes. Stained with blood. The boy must have been killed. Ha! Ah, his father wept. The man wept. A wild animal had eaten my son. And after weeping, he mourned the boy for a few days. Life moved on. Life moved on. His brothers knew the boy did not die. They knew. They sold him and ate the money. In fact, their father saw him them eating the fat cook they bought with the money. And life moved on. They thought they've gotten rid of this boy for good. Imagine being Joseph and thinking of the evil your brothers did to you. Now Joseph is a slave. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. But he never allowed any of the things that happened to him to make him bitter. Hallelujah. Because Joseph was focused on growth. How do I know? He kept on growing. You go in the direction of your focus. I say you move in the direction of your what? So are you growing? You've been, you've been challenged for many years. Are you growing? How do you know that, that <laughs> you are being trained by what you're going through if growth is happening? If growth is not happening, then you are not viewing the challenges through the right spectacles. Hallelujah. Joseph was growing. In Potiphar's house, before you knew what was happening, he became a supervisor. He became a supervisor. Now he's enjoying bigger pay. He's enjoying con control. He's the manager of all the slaves in the house. You think he was doing hard labor anymore when he's a supervisor? He's the one pointing out people who are not working hard. He's the one dishing out ration. He's the one paying people salaries. The Bible said in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar did not know about anything he owned. Everything was in the control of Joseph. So he was no longer operating as a slave. He had grown. Why? Because he was focused on growth. He saw himself, this challenge, my brothers put me through betrayal, but this is working for my good. How do I know? When eventually he revealed his identity to his brothers, what did he tell them? He said, you meant these things for evil. But God meant it for what? For good. That has been his mindset from beginning. All evil is working for me. All challenges are working for me. All difficulties. Come on, somebody say it. All difficulties. Are, whatever you're going through right now is what? Working for your promotion. That's a victory consciousness. If you can't see it working for you, you are, you are not having the right consciousness. You need to change. You need to upgrade your thinking. You are level one. Difficulty is making you panic. Difficulty is making you grumble. It not, it's not supposed to be that way. Hallelujah. So check yourself. Go home. Ask yourself the question. The challenges you're facing right now, how is he making you feel? That tells you where your level is. 
Because people at the higher level, difficulty excites them. Oh. Difficulty does what? Challenges excite them because they see the good that's coming out of it. Joshua and Caleb looked at the giants. The people, the, the 10, 12 of them went to spy the land. 10 came back with an evil report. 10 saw the giants and they say, yo, these giants are about to eat us up. These giants are so big. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't go. They are going to eat us up. The land eats up its inhabitants. Joshua and Caleb says, what are you people talking about? These giants, they are our bread. They are what? What's your attitude towards bread? You go, you go towards it. They say, my God, let us go at once. For God is able to give us the land. What is that? Victory consciousness. God is able to give us the land. We, we're not backing down. Guys, why are you? Bible said Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes. They tore their clothes. Why are you people crying? Why are you people shouting? There's no problem here. This is blessing. These giants are bread for us. Let's go. The other ten says never. We're not going. In fact, the Bible said the other ten turned around and and spread an evil report in the camp of the Israelites. And everybody started grumbling and complaining. They turned around and picked up stones to stone Moses. What? Hey! hey. We, what, what are you talking about? We're not going. You want us to go and die with giants, kill us? We're not going. We are not going. Moses was, and Bible said they picked up stones to stone Moses. And Bible said God was grieved by their hardness of heart. Because they have tested God ten times. This was the problem. These people, all their journey from Egypt, listen, please, let me round this message up. All their journey from Egypt, all the challenges they were facing from Egypt was supposed to train them in victory consciousness. But they were not growing. They were not growing. The reason why they had to deal with the ten plagues of Egypt was so that they could grow in their confidence in God to rescue them. The confidence in God to make a way. And guess what? God was showing them miracles. God opened the Red Sea by a miracle. They saw the miracle of God when he opened the Red Sea. And they walked on dry ground. The Bible said a highway was made in the sea. That should have shown them that this God can do anything. But guess what? They were not growing. Every time they saw the miracle of God, they enjoyed the miracle, but they did not take the lesson. They enjoyed the miracle, but they did not take the lesson. Don't be like that. Help me tell your neighbor, don't be like that. Have you seen God come through for you? It's supposed to change your heart to believe he will come through again and again. Hallelujah. It's supposed to, what you're going through is supposed to be transforming your heart into a victory consciousness. Your experiences in defeating problem after problem is supposed to train you that you can declare like Apostle Paul, I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Hallelujah. So focus on growth. Number five, as you begin to win, acknowledge and celebrate small wins. Acknowledge and do what? And do what? Celebrate you, you are believing God for 100 rand, 100 rand came. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. That God who provided 100 rand, he's able to provide 100,000. He's able to provide 100 million. That's the truth. So you need to celebrate the small wins. It helps you grow. Why do you think that David was able to challenge Goliath? He said to Saul, I came against a lion and I defeated the lion. A bear came and I fought the bear. I defeated the bear. The lion and the bear were training in victory consciousness for David. So this Goliath, I will bring him down. Don't worry. The same God who helped me, the same God who made a way for a thousand rand, will make a way for a hundred thousand. You just need to believe it. You just you need to get that fear. This is why this whole teaching about the goodness of God needs to sink in. 
Because when you know the goodness of God, you don't doubt him. So, listen, listen. This whole experience for the children of Israel through Egypt into the promised land was to show them that God is good. It's, that's what it is to get out of their heart the stain we got from Adam that God wants to do us in. That God is not faithful. That God cannot make a way. But the problem was that they were not learning. I'm asking you a question. Are you receiving the training? Or are you, are you allowing the situation make you bitter? Make you afraid? Make you... You will, you will re-enroll in school. And the school will help you. Amen. Number, f- number six, I'll round up on the seventh one, on the eighth one. Learn from setbacks. Look into resilience. Whenever things don't go, ask the quest- question. See setbacks differently. What did I learn from this? What did I miss here? And if you ask the Holy Spirit, this is his job. Let me say this again. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. To teach you all things. To teach you the things you don't know. So that you can experientially manifest at the highest level of victory. This is why the Holy Spirit is given to you. So ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to learn? What didn't I get right? What didn't I, why, where am I missing it? If you pay attention, the Spirit of God will show you. He will show you your unbelief. He will show you where you're doubting. He will show you where you are missing it. And you learn and grow. This is why it's important to develop that one-on-one relationship with him. Because he wants to show you all things, including the secret of learning and overcoming all things. Number seven, surround yourself with positivity. This is why you come to church. This is why you sit under a practitioner who practices faith. Hallelujah. Me, I'm, fi- I'm, I'm in the fight. Oh, yes. I know how to fight this fight. So when I'm saying some things, is because of the things I've gone through, I've learned. Hallelujah. And I've seen God come through. Whether it's a situation in my health, whether it's a situation with I've seen God come through. And I know that whatever else that I have as a challenge, he will come through. I, me, I know it. It's not, I'm not waiting for you to confirm it. Me, I know. From the experience of many years of fighting battles, I know I will have the victory once again. Hallelujah. So surround yourself with positivity. Surround yourself with people who walk by faith and understand how to fight. Listen to messages from people who have fought in the trenches and won because they are talking from experience. This is how, so you, you surround yourself with faith-filled words. Listen to message. Take this kind of message. Listen to it over and over again. Find others from people who have won. Surround your heart. This is where the problem is. Your heart. Your heart keeps shaking like this. Keeps shaking like this. Stabilize your heart with words of faith. Stabilize your heart with testimonies. Of victory. Because here, the God who did it for that person. He's not a respecter of persons. The God who raised that person from the dead. He's still your God. Hallelujah. And if he did it before, he would do it again. So keep yourself surrounded with positivity. With testimonies of victory. And, and there are testimonies of victory from around the world. What, God, how, what has God not done? What has God not done? I heard the testimony. In fact, I was reading on the internet somebody who had metal implant in their body. You know the implant that surgeons put in your body? Metal implant. He woke up in the morning. The implant was outside of his body on the bed. I saw it. It's not, I saw the video. He supernatural surgery in the middle of the night. God sent an angel, opened his leg, took out the implant, covered it and put it on the bed. He woke up in the morning and saw a piece of metal on the bed. He is in shock. He goes to the hospital, do an x-ray. The implant is no longer there. When he, he, when he got to the hospital and, and you know, asked for an x-ray, this, the pers- x-ray person says, there's nothing wrong here. He took the x-ray to the orthopedic surgeon who put the implant. 
And the man says, no, this cannot be your leg. This cannot be your leg. So the, the surgeon went into his fire and brought out a previous x-ray with the implant. He said, this cannot be your leg. Then the man opened his back and brought out the implant. He brought out the implant, put it on the table of the orthopedic surgeon. This surgeon is screaming, how? How did this come out of your leg? You're telling me the God who performed that miracle is my God. Because the doctor says it's impossible. And it, that's the truth. It is what? Medically impossible. But our God does impossible things. So imagine surrounding yourself with testimonies of impossibilities like this. Your heart is stabilized. You know that the God who did this is my God. He can do it for me. He opened the Red Sea and the people went through in the dry ground. He is still your God. He came to a wedding, turned water into wine. He's still your God. They gave him five loaves and two fish. He multiplied it and fed. He's still your, come on somebody. This is why you stay with positivity. God who did, when your heart is short with positivity, you always have the victory at the end of the day. Number eight, practice gratitude. Practice what? Wake up in the morning thanking God for the victory. I don't know where it's coming from, but I know of victory. When your heart wants to fall into negativity, Tell the devil, you will not make me feel sad. You will not make me feel weak. You will not make me feel overwhelmed. You will not make me feel anxious. Bust into praise. Put on worship and begin to praise God. Because the God you serve makes a way where there seems to be no way. And do you know, this I know from experience, a way makes itself revealed. And when the answer comes, you add it to your arsenal. The God who did it for me yesterday and made this one, he will do this one again. This is why you, you note your miracles, you note your testimonies. Practice gratitude. When the devil tells you this cannot happen, go back on the things God did yesterday. He made a way yesterday. He made a way two weeks ago. He made a way five months ago. He will make a way again and begin to praise him. And you will see him make a way. And then when he makes that way, you add it. It prepares you now for the next level. Hallelujah. I'm done this morning. All right. Let's, let's pray. Can you?